Okay, are you ready for me to be insufferable for the next 40 minutes about this game? Yeah? Yeah? Cool. Silent Hill 3 came out on May 23rd, 2003. Today, this game celebrates its 20 year anniversary, and I can still confidently say that as a horror game, it has aged like fine wine. This game is incredibly special to me. It was my first Silent Hill and my favorite in the franchise for many years. Heather Mason was even my first ever cosplay, which are photos I truly hope never see the light of day on the internet because dear God, it was an awful cosplay. So this will definitely be a personal video, probably more more so than my other uploads because I just want a reason to geek about this game, okay? Silent Hill 3 acts as a direct sequel to the original Silent Hill on PlayStation 1, following Heather Mason, a teenager whose life is completely derailed one day when members of a cult called the Order track her down and want to force her to birth a god. In the years since the game's release, Silent Hill 3 has gone on to become one of the fan favorites of the franchise, and the game is overall regarded as a staple in the horror genre, even going on to be the basis for the second film adaption, Silent Hill Revelation. You're kind of funny, Heather. You're pretty fucked up, but I don't know, I... I think you're goofy fun inside. Goofy fun... That'd be nice. Change. That film adaption was also god-awful. In comparison to Silent Hill 2's more lonely, introspective atmosphere, Silent Hill 3 returns to the series' roots with its unapologetically violent horror, with the rusted, bleeding walls and terrifying imagery that is often synonymous with the franchise. And a lot of people, when they talk about Silent Hill 3, often say that its story is pretty surface level, it's just more of the cult storyline, and doesn't have the depth and profound storytelling we see in Silent Hill 2. And this was a mentality I always thoroughly disagreed with. I would argue that it's just as deep, if not even more so, than 2 in many respects, mainly because the horror in Silent Hill 3 draws its inspiration from something that runs a bit deeper than just cults and creepy priests. The horrors that can come with just being a woman. Eurothug actually discussed this topic in their video, The Real Horrors of Silent Hill 3, and I highly recommend checking out this video and Eurothug's content in general, they're a fantastic creator. Otherwise though, I rarely see it discussed in detail enough, and it's a topic that I find fascinatingly underrated amongst fanbase discourse. So for this game's 20th anniversary, I would like to discuss how Silent Hill 3 explores womanhood through horror. We do have to remember that it is a direct sequel to Silent Hill 1, so for all of us to be on the same page, let's quickly re-familiarize ourselves with how it all began. The first game follows Harry Mason, who's traveling to the town of Silent Hill with his adoptive daughter Cheryl. While driving, a shadowy figure causes Harry to crash, and when he comes to, Cheryl is nowhere to be seen. While exploring the seemingly abandoned town looking for her, he soon finds that it's infested with monsters and creatures, and switches between the regular town setting to a hellish, rusted otherworld seemingly at random. Harry continues to search for Cheryl regardless, but to no avail. He eventually meets Dahlia and Alessa Gillespie, members of a local cult called the Order. He learns that Dahlia and the Order were forcing Alessa to give birth to a god, but Alessa, having supernatural powers, split her soul in two to prevent this from happening. One half of the soul stayed in Silent Hill as Alessa, and the other half was Cheryl. Their souls now rejoined, Alessa unwillingly gives birth to the god. As we defeat the creature, she appears one final time, thanking Harry for everything he's done and giving him a child. Harry manages to escape, moving on with his life and now raising this child. Fast forward to Silent Hill 3, which takes place 17 years after the events of the first game, and we now play as that child, Heather Mason. The game starts with a rather ominous dream sequence, where Heather finds herself in a nightmarish amusement park, eventually waking up in a shopping centre, or malls as you Americans call them, and brushing it off as nothing more than a strange dream, Heather starts heading home before being followed by a detective called Douglas. While trying to shake him off, Heather then encounters a lady named Claudia, who starts to babble on about some culty BS that just confuses Heather even further. We can safely gather from this though that Heather has no knowledge whatsoever of what happened all those years ago in Silent Hill. Not too long after this, Heather meets Vincent, a priest with the Order who seems to be on Heather's side, or at least he acts like that to her face. Eventually finding her way home, she tragically discovers that her father, Harry, has been murdered in his own apartment. She follows the blood trail up to the roof, where Claudia tells her that Harry's murder was revenge for 17 years ago, the events of Silent Hill 1, for stealing Heather away from the cult. 
Enraged and saddened by this, Heather and Douglas follow Claudia to the town of Silent Hill, eventually cornering them in the chapel. Heather then begins to birth the god, presumably dormant inside her all these years later, but manages to halt the demonic birth using a drug called the Aglophodus, or Agleophodus, I never knew how to pronounce this word. In a moment of desperation, Claudia becomes the new host for the god by uh, eating it. Uh. God is reborn again, and much like the original, this serves as the final boss of the game. Afterwards, Heather mourns her father's death, but eventually regains composure, finally being able to move on with her life. Silent Hill 3 acts as the only game in the franchise that is a direct sequel. You can certainly play 3 without having played the original, I mean, that's what I did. 3 was my first Silent Hill, like I said, but there's a lot of great details that you'll appreciate a lot more if you're already familiar with the first game. A great example being the actual progression of Silent Hill 3 is very cleverly crafted to mirror the progression of the first game. This is a detail that completely went over my head for years because it's not really that obvious until someone points it out to you. Both games start with a a nightmarish dream sequence that ends with Harry and Heather dying. After this, both characters wake up in a diner or cafe, where they soon meet a detective or police officer. Both have a crazy cult lady as the primary villain, and a morally dubious associate of that villain who we just can't tell whether or not they're truly on her side. And both games end with killing the newly birthed god. Even when it comes to the puzzles, there are similarities. Both games involve a puzzle using a blood bag, a camera, with the very last puzzle requiring you to collect five items to unlock a door. Even the areas we visit are identical. There's a sewer area, there's an amusement park, and a final hellish otherworld. The progression of three very much mirrors the original as it shows how history is repeating itself. Both Harry and Heather were unwillingly dragged into a dangerous cult trying to birth a god, and both of them lose someone important to them along the way. Harry lost his original daughter Cheryl, while Heather lost Harry. Heather is a character I have a lot of love for, and there is a lot of nostalgia speaking here, I will admit, because being a young girl growing up playing as an equally very ordinary everyday teenager was a really refreshing experience. It's something the Silent Hill franchise has always been very good for. Instead of having another run-of-the-mill action hero who can gun down a million monsters back to back without breaking a sweat, you're playing as just a regular guy who can only defend himself with a stick and can just about use a handgun but has to fumble for a few seconds reloading due to inexperience experience. Because as much as all of us would like to think we'd be badasses if we found ourselves in a similar situation, we wouldn't. We'd barely manage to find ourselves a weapon of any sort, which would probably just end up being a stick, we'd be out of breath when we have to run away from the monsters, and we'd overall have a really hard time dealing with even just one of them, let alone two or more. That's why I always gave this franchise the pass for having a fairly clunky and basic combat system. You're not really meant to fight at all if you can help it, just like you realistically wouldn't fight in real life. And Heather is no exception to this rule, almost whimpering in fear when an enemy attacks her. But that realistic design doesn't just stop at the gameplay in Silent Hill 3. A lot of care was put into Heather's character design and personality to really make her feel like a genuine teenage girl. She has freckles, and her skin is somewhat blemished on her face and arms. She's clearly not wearing any makeup of any sort, which goes pretty well with her tomboyish personality. So instead, we can see the bags under her eyes like as if she hasn't gotten much sleep the night before. Her outfit even looks somewhat mismatched. I mean, maybe it's just my personal taste in clothing. I wouldn't exactly call her outfit terribly stylish or well-coordinated, which gives me the impression she's still trying to find a style that suits her. She's a teenager who's finally learning to express herself in her clothing, but she isn't quite there yet. Even the first area of the game after the nightmare sequence is a fitting place for her character. We start off in a shopping centre, a pretty typical place for a teenager to hang out. And you know we can't talk about this opening sequence without mentioning that stupidly sexy music, End of Small Sanctuary. Look, there is a reason this is one of the most popular songs in the franchise. Not only is it so chill and goes just as hard today as it did 20 years ago, but it feels like music Heather probably listened to herself. This game is set in the early 2000s, and so this track has those hints of Portishead, a bit of Nirvana, you know, the alt and grunge rock that the 90s were so well known for. And the lazy guitar and drums really match up nicely with the late evening sun going down, and just, ugh, dude, just the vibes are immaculate. 
Teenage portrayals in media have always been pretty hit and miss. I'm sure we can all agree on that. You can just tell when it's someone in their 50s trying to write a person who's half their age, and a lot of the time it ends up either being really cringy or just downright wrong. And I'm not judging. I mean, I'm only in my mid-twenties, and if you ask me to write a realistic 50-year-old character, I would absolutely struggle. And so in this case, considering the dev team were all adults, most likely in their 30s or possibly older, it's really impressive how they captured what was, at that point in time, the modern teenage experience, an era they didn't even grow up in. Even more impressive that it's a bunch of Japanese developers specifically depicting the American teenage experience of the time. But where the developers' talents really shine when it comes to Heather is her personality. Still, to this day, 20 years later, I think Heather is the most realistic portrayal of a teenage girl that we have ever gotten in a video game. Too often are teenage characters written off as just snarky and moody just because that's how teenagers are. They're just always constantly angsty, aren't they? But with Heather, she responds to situations in a very natural way. She does have some of that angst because she is a hot-headed and vocal character by nature, but it doesn't just feel like aggressiveness shoehorned in just because of her age. It feels real. She loses her temper and sometimes throws a bit of a tantrum because she's still ultimately a kid. She's only 17 and is still lacking in the emotional maturity that you usually would have by the time you're an adult. That figures. He's a pretty sneaky guy. Don't talk about my dad like that! This is especially present anytime she meets Claudia. Instead of letting Claudia go on her epic cult monologues that make no sense whatsoever to your average person, when all Heather wants to know is why there are suddenly so many monsters roaming around, Heather instead just says this. I am Claudia. So what? Her complete no-nonsense attitude is a rarity amongst female characters in video games, especially in horror. On the PS2, a lot of female protagonists tended to be very dainty and feminine, and while they were still brave enough to face the terrors they endured, I still never felt they were very realistic portrayals of women. It's why I'm not the biggest fan of the Fatal Frame games, for example. I love the setting and the gameplay mechanics of them, but I always just got so bored of the main characters. They still had that damsel in distress quality, and I even remember thinking as a kid, where the hell are the more assertive female characters to even the scales a little bit here? I mean, all I'm saying is if I came across a terrifying ghost or creature, I'd probably let out an oh shit or Jesus Christ because it's a natural human reaction, I think. But you never see those characters react in a human way. They were just a bit too passive for my liking and it honestly killed my immersion in Fatal Frame. Heather is exactly the opposite. When she encounters the first monster in the shopping center, her eyes widen in fear. She manages to pick up the nearby gun and just about keep her composure, relieved when the monster finally falls to the ground. Around. What the hell is this thing? Heather's attitude isn't just present in cutscenes though. It's well worth examining everything you come across during gameplay just to read some of her quips and inner thoughts. Like Heather commenting on how insanely expensive a painting is in the art gallery, or noticing a few wine bottles and saying, I don't really feel like eating and drinking stuff from an alternate reality, okay? Not only does it provide some light-hearted flavour text for the player, but the game even uses these as an opportunity to help us further paint a picture of what kind of girl Heather was before the events of Silent Hill 3. For example, when you notice an ashtray, Heather comments, No more cigarettes for me, I quit for good, implying Heather used to be a smoker despite only being 17 years old. This is something that any generation can relate to. Kids are always going to try things behind their parents' back, whether the parents like it or not, especially in their experimental teenage years. And simple comments like this from Heather really add another layer of relatability to her character. This playful personality comes to a grinding halt, though, after the passing of her father. Not only is Harry's death upsetting for Heather, but also for those who spent the entirety of the first game playing as him. Heather lost someone important to her, and so did the fans. The protagonist we were rooting for back on the PlayStation 1, where it all began. The doting father who quite literally went through hell to save his daughter. And here he is, years later, murdered in cold blood. Naturally, Heather goes through a roller coaster of emotions at this point in the story. After the initial shock of finding the body, Heather storms up to the roof to confront Claudia, who manages to get away. And it's after this that a deep sadness sets in. She can't deny that her father's dead anymore or channel her pain into anger towards Claudia. All she's left with now is to face the reality that he's gone and never coming back. I don't know what to say. Then don't say anything. I'm fine, so... Just get out of here and leave me alone already! Calm down. I just... Calm down! 
How, how am I supposed to do that? My father is dead. He's murdered. Get out. This is all your fault. If it weren't for you... I'm sorry. Then go! It's after Harry's death that we see a massive change in Heather's behaviour. For someone so young to lose such a close family member in such horrific circumstances is obviously immensely traumatic. And what makes it all the worse is that, now that he's gone, Heather is left all alone in this world. She never had a mother and is an only child. She's been abandoned in this world and still hasn't even hit adulthood, left to face her battles and the rest of her life now on her own. She even shows slight resentment towards Harry for dying, though this likely is just her frustration at the situation being taken out on him, commenting, Dad, why did you have to die? You told me you were the strongest man in the world. Liar. Overall, Heather adopts a far more cynical outlook on things from here on out, rarely ever cracking a joke or making a snarky comment as she would have up until now. Heather's solemn outlook remains this way for the rest of the game. I never had a chance to tell you, to tell you how happy you made me. What's interesting though is Harry gets a surprising amount of character development for a game he isn't even really in. That space of 17 years as Harry was raising Heather is something we still don't know a whole ton about, but after finding Harry's notebook in the apartment, we learn about how conflicted he felt raising Heather. Referring to her, Harry writes this. I confess I had reservations at first about raising that baby. Could I love her? Her existence was thoroughly unexplainable. I thought she could be that young woman who snatched away my beloved daughter. That led to sadness, anger. There were times when I put my hands around her tiny little throat. Several times I even considered abandoning her. That's what a terrible person I am. He ends the note saying, I decided to raise her after all. I just couldn't seem to let her go. When she... When you look at me, you laugh, so... Even now, I can't forget about that girl. But I love you. I have no doubts about that. That's all I ask you to believe. To my precious daughter, Harry Mason. I really appreciate the development that Harry's character gets here because it would be just as easy to point the finger and say he was a horrible person for writing these things down. And Heather, reading this after his death and realizing her own father struggled to love her, would naturally feel conflicted as well. Harry basically just admitted in writing that at one point in time he hated her existence, even if it was for very understandable reasons. He lost Cheryl and just because he was given a replacement baby, for lack of a better phrase, this doesn't change how distraught he must have felt to losing a child. And Heather was, after all, given to him by a demonic entity, the same demonic entity that stole Cheryl away from him. Nothing could ever fill that feeling of loss, but he was able to come to terms with this and raise Heather regardless, loving her just as much as he loved Cheryl. And by the end of the game, Heather's love for her father doesn't waver either, despite the harsh truth he wrote in that notebook, changing her name to Cheryl to honor him. Heather, did you- You don't have to call me that. I'm not hiding anymore. You want me to use your real name? What was it again? Cheryl. The name my father gave me. But let's talk about the horrors that Heather faces during the game. A typical running theme with the other world in Silent Hill is it often molds and shapes itself around the person experiencing it. In Silent Hill 1, Harry is experiencing the dark, twisted world of Alessa's psyche. The walls were rusted and stained red, and there were wheelchairs and gurneys scattered about as Alessa spent much of her childhood in the hospital thanks to an abusive mother. Since Heather is effectively Alessa reborn once again, her other world is somewhat of a Frankenstein between Alessa's horrifying childhood experiences and Heather's own experiences growing up. Because of this, the other world maintains the visual appearance of Silent Hill 1, but the horror within it takes on a very different form. The other world in Silent Hill 3 is rather cruel and malicious, often taunting Heather and playing on her fears that only the more observant players would notice. Some of these fears are particular to Heather, and others are more general fears that any woman could relate to. For one, the amusement park. Seeing a place that should otherwise be happy and bustling with life as a gloomy, dark, unwelcoming space proves to us that the town of Silent Hill is making fun of Heather's age and the fact she's still a child. Taking a place that she likely has fond memories of as a child and giving it a dangerous, threatening atmosphere. 
We see this again later on when we return to the amusement park and have no choice but to pass through the Borley Haunted Mansion. What is meant to be just a spooky, harmless attraction was turned into a murder scene, with the narrator implying that the bodies Heather sees are not simply just installations. For some people, the Borley Haunted Mansion is a strange tonal shift from the rest of the game, but that's exactly the intention. It's poking fun at Heather's innocence, taking something playful and changing it into something sinister. And the narrator's comical, over-exaggerated way of speaking becomes a lot less funny when you realise he's actually speaking directly to you. I'm so sorry. This place is just falling apart. The mechanism is broken, you see. It wasn't supposed to stop there, I assure you. Another example is in Heather's fear of mirrors. In the very first room of the game, the bathroom where she hides from Douglas, if you examine the mirror, she says this. I don't like mirrors. It's almost like there's an unknown world right on the other side. And the person staring at me isn't really me, just an imitator. I know how stupid that sounds, but that's how I feel. But if I keep thinking about it, it just makes me feel sick. This exact fear is used against her later on in the Otherworld Hospital, in the infamous Mirror Room. The visceral sounds eventually become overwhelming before the player realises they're locked in. This perfectly illustrates how cruel the Otherworld experience is for Heather. She's locked into a room and forced to look at her own reflection become bloodied and disgusting. In contrast to the Otherworld in Silent Hill 2, which felt like it was shaming and torturing James for what he'd done, the Otherworld in Silent Hill 3 is menacing, bullying Heather by playing on her deepest fears. Heather's fear of mirrors is utilised once more when she fights the memory of Alessa, a violent doppelganger that attacks her in the amusement park. Though this fear of mirrors may also be suggestive of body image issues on Heather's part. Perhaps she doesn't like looking in the mirror because she's unhappy with herself physically a sentiment many people can relate to in their awkward teenage years. These insecurities even manifest themselves in the enemy design. The very first enemy we encounter, for example the Closer, has a disgusting bloated and swollen form, as if to possibly poke fun at Heather's own bodily insecurities. But as a matter of fact, body horror is very central to Silent Hill 3 as a whole, especially considering the game's central conflict. Heather, still a child, is being forced to give birth to a god. From the moment she meets Claudia, it's as good as set in stone that this will be the case. And while the idea of birthing a god may be surreal and out of this world, the idea of forced pregnancy most certainly is not. Pregnancy is already a terrifying thought, even at the best of times. It completely alters your body for nine months and can sometimes have severe lasting impacts even after birth not to mention caring for an entire human being for years thereafter. And that's something you endure happily when you want a child, but for a 17-year-old girl, that's the last thing on their mind. Most teenagers are barely mature enough mentally to take care of themselves, let alone a child. So the idea of it being forced on someone is nothing short of a nightmare. There are many subtle details throughout Silent Hill that make nods to pregnancy and childbirth as a whole. There's an awful lot of blood imagery in this game, and especially given her age, this also ties into the topic of menstruation. The game commits to this imagery so much to the point some hallways straight up look like they're designed to be birth canals. The first major item you use to help you pull down a ladder is a hanger, an item that has been used rather dangerously by women in the past as a desperate method of abortion. When passing through the sewers, if the player isn't careful, it's possible for Heather to be dragged underwater by an unseen monster, with the tentacle that emerges from the water looking an awful lot like an umbilical cord. Even the basic, weakest enemy we encounter throughout the game is the Numbody, a creature with a shape that is very much comparable to sperm. It ambles around awkwardly on its legs, letting out a strange wail that sounds like the distorted cry of a child. Even at the story's finale, Heather effectively aborts the god within her. Using the aglaphidus her father gave her, a red liquid that's said to protect the user from demonic spirits, she manages to expel the god from her body, regaining the autonomy that Claudia and the Order took away from her. After Claudia forcibly becomes the new host for this god, she falls through a hole in the ground that very clearly takes the shape of a vagina. I mean, you can't get more on the nose than that, right? 
But what is probably even more relevant to young women than the idea of forced pregnancy is stalking, a topic that Silent Hill 3 delves into quite heavily. It is an unfortunate but real fact that young women, and particularly teenage girls, can often be the victims of stalking or predatory behaviour from people who will manipulate their youthful naivety to their advantage. And this is probably the most unnerving element to Silent Hill 3's story, at least to me. At the beginning, when we encounter Douglas for the first time, we see Heather being followed rather persistently by him, even after she's made it amply clear that she's not interested in talking. Need I remind you that this is a man who looks to be in his 50s, obsessively following a child through a shopping centre. Even in a populated, brightly lit, and what should otherwise be a safe place for a young girl, Heather still finds herself being harassed by a stranger. Are you still following me? Do I have to scream? She ends up retreating to the bathroom and ends up climbing out the window to escape him. It seems Douglas respects the boundary set in place by a bathroom door quicker than he respects Heather's choice to not speak to him. In general, all of the other characters around Heather are noticeably predatory in this game. The entire cast of Silent Hill 3 can simply be boiled down to the age-old phrase, Stranger Danger. Douglas, who does eventually end up helping Heather and acting somewhat as a stand-in for Harry after his death, is still, ultimately, a stranger. And even when Heather lets her guard down and allows Douglas to help her, he still points a gun at her at one point, remarking that killing her there and then might be the only way to end this nightmare. While Douglas is helpful towards Heather throughout the game and very well may have no ill intent towards her, the fact he even considered shooting her despite everything she's gone through shows that he doesn't truly have Heather's best intentions in mind. And believe it or not, when compared to the other characters, he's the kindest of the bunch. Vincent has always been a fascinating character to me, mainly because he's the perfect depiction of the stereotypical creep. He knows that Heather is just a child who's still naive to the world and how it works, and most of his conversations with her have a menacing undertone. Go northwest on Nathan Avenue. It's a bit far, hmm, but closer than heaven. He doesn't really care about Heather or her safety at all, but he acts like it because it ultimately benefits him to do so. As we learn in a file in the final area, Vincent was embezzling funds from the Order for his own personal benefit, and so he likely disagrees with Claudia's plans to birth a god because it'll disrupt his comfortable lifestyle. However, it's not until the very end that we learn this information. So up until that point, Vincent appeared to be helping Heather because of their mutual disdain for Claudia, when in reality, it's safe to assume it was really only for his personal gain. This cruelty in Vincent's personality is at its worst when he says this. You come here and enjoy spilling their blood and, and listening to them cry out. You feel excited when you step on them and snuff out their lives. Are you talking about the monsters? Monsters? They look like monsters to you? <gasps> the line that makes both Heather and the player question every single enemy they killed up until this point. And while I do think this was just a cruel joke and nothing more, the fact that Vincent's perfectly fine toying with Heather's emotions at a crucial time like this certainly shows how little he cares for her overall. Leonard, a character we encounter very briefly in Brookhaven Hospital, is equally predatory and manipulative in this sense. Heather goes to find him because she's led to believe he can help her stop Claudia, but says he'll only do so if she frees him from his cell. Heather keeps up her end of the bargain, though she's clearly uncomfortable in his cell as Leonard hides out of sight. In fact, you can even see him peering down from above and watching her if you look closely in one of the cutscenes. Upon learning that Heather isn't a member of the Order, he becomes enraged and attempts to kill her. Much like Vincent, Leonard was only using Heather as long as it benefited him. But unlike Vincent, he resorts to violence when she doesn't meet his demands. One very easily missed character comes in the form of Valtiel. Valtiel is a creature that can be seen at multiple points throughout the game and never directly interacts with Heather at any point. He's described as an angel of the Order. The word Valtiel even means attendant of God, and it appears he's working in the shadows to ensure Heather gives birth to their god. He can even be seen around the final boss arena, tending to the newly born creature. Some fans describe Valtiel as a sort of guardian angel, and while this may be true in that he's watching over Heather throughout the game, it's not with good intentions. Of course, being with the Order, Valtiel only wishes to see this god born, with no care for Heather beyond that. In fact, it's possible to get a very rare cutscene in certain areas of the game after dying, where Valtiel can be seen literally dragging Heather's body away, presumably to ensure the god is born. 
The knowledge that Valtiel is constantly watching over us only to make use of Heather's body is a thoroughly frightening concept. But perhaps the most disturbing example of predatory behaviour in Silent Hill 3 is Stanley, a character we never even see in person who stalks us throughout the Brookhaven Hospital. He writes letters to Heather that you can find gradually as you explore, always signing them off with his full name, Stanley Coleman. In the first letter, he says that he wants to give Heather his prized doll to commemorate them finally meeting, which you can find next to the note. Seeing Heather's name can startle you at first, but it's easy to write it off as purely coincidental. After all, he might just be referring to another Heather. In the second note, however, Stanley directly addresses the player's actions when he says, But why haven't you taken my doll with you? Ah, my gift must have embarrassed you. How cute you are, Heather. To say this note left me feeling deeply unsettled is an understatement. Not only does this prove that he is indeed addressing these letters to us, but it also means he's somewhere in the hospital at the same time as us, observing us from afar, at least enough to know that we didn't take his gift. This is made all the more terrifying when we can hear noises in the distance that sound like a heavy door slamming. Which we can only interpret as Stanley moving around the hospital much like we are. Similarly, if you go back to read one of Stanley's notes, it'll be gone by the time you return, implying he's only a few steps behind Heather and paying close attention to where she goes within the hospital. Stanley's behaviour, I would argue, even begins to border on incel, as in the same note he refers to the nurses working in the hospital as nasty wenches. While this could of course just be chalked down to general negativity towards the staff of the hospital, when paired with his possessive behaviour towards Heather, it definitely doesn't seem like he views women with much respect. Especially when he writes, If a thing has no meaning, there's no reason for it to exist at all, just as you exist for me. His writing gradually becomes more and more unhinged, as he comments on Heather ignoring his letters as cruel, but he knows deep down that she wants to be with him. You may not have yet realised your own true feelings, but you sense them unconsciously, and so you're trying to get closer to me. Stanley is clearly delusional, convincing himself that Heather is secretly in love with him and just playing hard to get, instead of acknowledging the fact that she simply may not be interested. Her suspicions that Stanley is dangerous are confirmed when he writes in his next letter that he killed a fellow patient for seemingly no reason, later saying he wants to carve the words I love Heather into his chest, but he doesn't believe these words are forceful enough for the emotions he feels. Stanley's letters solidified an intense feeling of anxiety for me as I explored the hospital. I found myself afraid of Stanley more than anything else I had encountered up until that point in the game, purely because of his frightening realism. Despite being in a nightmarish hospital in Silent Hill, of all places, it was one of its human patients, ironically enough, that terrified me the most. Especially in the past few years, as incel culture has become more of a prominent topic, Stanley's view of Heather not as a human being, but rather as an object that he possesses, is frighteningly relevant. Not only does he take his romantic frustrations out on the innocent patient he kills, but while reading the final letter, we can see the doll he wanted to gift to us broken and thrown across the bed. The doll represented his objectification of Heather, and when he realised she likely doesn't reciprocate those feelings, it evoked a violent reaction from him. As for what becomes of Stanley, he implies that Leonard is going to kill him without much explanation beyond that, and writes, If it weren't for his meddling, I would have been able to meet you in just a little while. Then I could have taken you to my world. And I fear to think what he means by my world. The last we hear about Stanley is when Heather gets a mysterious phone call. Is this Leonard? That's the murderer's name, not my name. I'm not your beloved Stanley either. He's underground now. His new name is Number Seven. <laughs> it can be presumed that by underground, the caller meant the morgue beneath the hospital. If we go down there, we can find a hospital bed labelled Number Seven and hear this. Silent Hill 3 even explores the idea of stalking back in the subway, in a completely optional and easily missed cutscene. Upon reading two different news magazines in the concourse, one that covers a recent suicide on the train tracks and the other discussing vengeful spirits, a cutscene will then occur when approaching the platform.
As if this wasn't creepy enough as is, I always felt like the ghost sounded a little too excited as he was approaching us, breathing very heavily, almost like he might be... You know... You know... Look, given the heavy themes of stalking and sexuality in this game, it certainly makes sense. This discomfort doesn't just present itself in the scares though, but also in the design of the areas themselves. While Silent Hill 2 opted for much more cramped, narrow hallways, Silent Hill 3 does the exact opposite. A lot of the areas are wide open, with long stretches of walking, and could very much be described as a liminal space, an aesthetic that relates to areas that are wide open and empty, and yet that exact emptiness ends up making them feel eerie and unsettling, especially since a lot of the areas in Silent Hill 3 are very normal everyday settings, an office block, an apartment building, a shopping centre, and that's exactly what makes them so much more horrifying. All these places should be bustling with life, and yet here we are, exploring them at night, completely on our own as a teenage girl. One area of the game that is permanently etched into my mind for its eeriness is the entrance to the construction site. You literally spend not even 10 seconds here, but it just feels so wrong walking through here. No one would ever need to be in a place like this so late at night. It's just so dark and lonely. I feel like there could be someone right around the corner, a human, mind you, not a monster, who's gonna jump out and attack at any second. No joke, I have literally had nightmares of this brief 10 second area of the game just because of how disturbingly real it is to me. It reminds me of an alleyway that you know you shouldn't go down but it's a quick path home and you just decided to take the risk. And growing up, we're always told, especially if you're a woman, to never walk home at night. Never walk down a dark alleyway. Always stay where it's brightly lit and populated. Even carry a weapon as some kind of self-defense. Something the game even acknowledges when Heather says Harry gave her a stun gun just in case. But what does Silent Hill 3 force you to do? Ignore all of that advice and walk down that dark alleyway, because frankly, you have no other choice. Couple those foreboding areas with the sound design and you've got some of the most subtly effective horror in a video game. Silent Hill as a franchise is already universally praised for its very distinct sound design, but the third game is easily the peak. Especially in that same construction site when you travel to the top floor and as you look around, you hear this. Walk a little further and you'll see a mattress and beer bottles thrown about, clearly showing someone has been squatting here and is still possibly somewhere nearby. And while that doesn't mean that they're a threat or anything, it's still unnerving to know that there is indeed someone nearby. If you're able to, I implore you to play Silent Hill 3 with headphones because there is so much subtle sound design that can be missed when playing it on a loudspeaker or through a TV. Needless to say, recording this video very late at night with headphones had me looking over my shoulder on more than a few occasions. But when God is born and Heather manages to defeat him, finally putting an end to the Order, it's hard to call it a win, really. There's no real feeling of triumph. If anything, taking down Claudia was just a means for Heather to distract from the pain of losing her father. And when that realisation kicks in, Heather breaks down. Revenge may be sweet, but it won't bring back the one you love. This ending still really hits hard, even after all these years. Too often do we see in revenge stories that the characters take down the evil, those who died along the way are finally avenged and everyone just goes back to a normal life. But let's be real, that is not at all how it would go. Once the dust settles and normality kicks back in for you, you would still feel a profound sense of loss and despair. Revenge, after all, can only numb your sadness for so long. I've only ever seen this bittersweet type of ending one other time, in the 2010 Korean thriller I Saw the Devil. 
After avenging his fiance who was brutally murdered, Soo Hyun walks away from the scene of the crime before breaking down in tears. Because even if getting revenge gave him closure, it'll never bring his fiance back. Much like Soo Hyun, Harry's death was a harsh reality that Heather tried to ignore for as long as possible. But with Claudia dead, there's no escaping it anymore. Not only is she mourning her father though, but also her loss of innocence. The events of Silent Hill 3 forced Heather to grow up far too quickly. Within the space of 24 hours, she went from relaxing at her local shopping centre while running some errands, to being stalked, finding her father's dead body, and being forced to give birth against her will. It shattered any childhood naivety she may have had left, and showed her how truly cruel the world can be, forcing her to endure what no adult ever should, let alone a child. She might be able to move on from this, but she'll never be the same again. Like I said, I first played Silent Hill 3 when I was about 12 or 13 years old, and what's funny to me is that virtually everything I've covered today went over my head as a child. As a teenager growing up, I always wrote off Silent Hill 3 as being the far more surface-level horror game compared to the more deep and thought-provoking storytelling we see in Silent Hill 2. And yet, replaying the game years later in my 20s, I was suddenly noticing the extremely female-centric horror that was lurking under the surface the entire time. A horror that I, much like Heather, was simply too young to understand before. Having experienced stalking, Stanley's notes were so much more unnerving. Having walked home alone at night, the quiet, empty spaces filled me with anxiety even though I had played the game plenty times before and knew nothing was going to jump out. Having encountered plenty creeps before, Vincent's manipulative behaviour felt ten times more threatening and predatory than it ever was to me as a child. And that's precisely where the beauty lies in Silent Hill 3, and the franchise as a whole. The horror doesn't lie in the monsters. The horror doesn't lie in the bloodstained walls or the terrifying music. It lies in what they represent. Those are the fears that unfortunately come with the fact of being a woman in the modern world. The respect and bodily autonomy you may be denied simply for being a woman. And the dangerous predatory behaviour you may have to deal with simply for existing. Even if you are a woman and have never experienced any of these things, there are many more out there who aren't as lucky, and despite being a 20-year-old game, what Heather experiences is still just as realistic and relevant today as it was in 2003. If anything, I think Silent Hill 3 should be treated as a learning experience for all who play. Of course, if you just want to play a spooky game and take the story at face value, that is perfectly fine. But for those who want to look at it on a more symbolic level, something this franchise is widely known for, it's a frightening insight into what is, for many women, a horrifying reality. A reality that doesn't go away when you turn off the game. Well, howdy there. Thank you so much for watching. I sincerely hope you enjoyed it. If you like what I do and you want to see more of it, I actually stream horror games over on Twitch a few times a week. Or if you just want to follow general updates to do with my future videos, feel free to drop me a follow over on Twitter. But otherwise, thank you so much for watching and I will see you next time. Oh, boy.